All righty. Hi, everybody. I want to we're going to start the series on grief and loss tonight, and I want to do something a little special. So I want to start off by doing, I'm going to ask Loretta to put up a photograph of the memorial wall, a starting point, because I want to, what I want to do tonight is dedicate this whole entire series to the people on that wall. It's a very special wall, and basically we have over 850 names on that wall, and some more names will be going on very shortly. So I really I just want to uh, take take a minute, and I want to be able to remember the people that have gone before us. It's a very special place. I, I like spending time there. And then basically, well, I'm going to just kind of read the prayer of St. Francis to connect with it. I'll take a moment of silence. Just remember those who have gone before us. Remember them in gratitude. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to console as to be consoled, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is a giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Okay. I want to kind of begin this series, and I divide it up into four parts. Tonight, I want to do an overview of the grieving process, what it is and what it's really all about. And then next week, I'll concentrate on the first three stages of grieving. And then the week after that, out of the last two stages in more detail and depth. And then finally, in the last week, we have a guest speaker, Pat Oakes. I'll be introducing her. Pat is our grief counselor at, at Starting Point and works primarily with families who have lost children in one way or another, either through addiction or things of that effect. And also, she's a very special lady because she lost a child of her own. So she's a very interesting lady. She has a lot to share and does some beautiful work. So she'll, she'll have the, the last session of the, of the series. To begin the series, I want to do something I always lo love doing. And that is I want to kind of share with you kind of a story from scripture. And I love the analogy of it. And it goes like this. A man went out to sow some seed. Some of the seed he fell, fell on rock. Some of the seed fell on shallow sandy soil. Some of the seed fell amongst weeds and thorns. And some of the seed fell on good ground. The seed that fell on the rock had a hard time penetrating it. So eventually it died and went away. The seed that fell amongst the shallow sandy soil started to grow, but it was too shallow. The first rainstorm washed it away. The seed that fell amongst the weeds and thorns started to grow but it got choked out. The seed that fell on the good ground got roots, foundations, and from that, beautiful things developed. I share that because tonight when we talk about the grieving process, I refer to it as the lifetime process. Whenever I talk about grieving, I always know that grieving to me is a process we all participate in every day of our life. When Kubler-Ross, wrote the book, Death and Dying, and put together the five stages of grieving. She was primarily gearing towards people that were on their deathbed and people that were in the process of dying. But tonight, when we look at the five stages, we look at them, yes, from those that we've lost in death, but also we look at them from the perspective of our general outlook on life and how life affects us and changes us in our journey. You see, grieving is something we do every day. It's a process we go through. Every time we experience change, new directions, we have to let go of the old. Saying goodbye to the old is always hard because we're used to it. But opening up to the new is something more beautiful. And yet we go through a grieving because we're in this constant process of changing as we go through life. 
a good example of this, I want to kind of bring it out because the five stages of grieving, just to bring them out tonight, are denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and acceptance. And denial, by the way, I have to share this with you because I, it has a bad name. Denial is not something negative. Denial is a protection. Sometimes we have to stay in denial until we're ready to deal with something, especially when it comes to areas of grief and areas of change. Many of us stay in situations that are very unhealthy for us for a long period of time because we don't want to face them and deal with them, so we can block them in denial. I know I did it when I was in the priesthood. I wanted to experience change. I wanted to make decisions, and I knew what I had to do, but I couldn't do it. So I stayed in that process of just staying trapped, staying stuck all the time. We see that in many areas of life. And so many times in doing that denial process, it's a protection. I'll share a story to bring out what I'm, what I'm talking about. When I was a young priest and I was stationed in Vineland, New Jersey, this gentleman who was a contractor came home from work one day. He walked into his house and as he walked in the door, he witnessed his son committing suicide. At that moment, he went through a tremendous trauma and froze. His wife came home two hours later, found her son laying on the floor, and had him sitting at the table eating a bowl of soup. Hard to understand, but no. When he experienced that situation, everything inside of him shut down and closed off. He froze solid from the trauma. For as he was concerned, it wasn't happening. And as a result, he just basically blocked and went on with the daily things he normally does. He wasn't ready. In his situation, he went through the funeral. He went through all the normal things we go through. He got through them okay, no problem. And then later on, they went to send to see a psychiatrist who did an evaluation and said to the family, now I want you to listen. This man is in a state of shock. And only come out of it when he's ready to come out of it. There's no therapy or anything that's going to force him out of it. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to wait. And the radical part was about three and a half to four months later, he was sitting in the living room watching TV. And all of a sudden, this powerful scream came out of him. Yelling, screaming, carrying on. Just going half berserk. Finally, it hit him. He finally opened it up. And he went into that anger stage, that frustration stage. All those things came flying out of him. All that stuff he had buried for a long period of time came screaming out. And as a result, he was then able to begin the process of grieving. It's hard. So denial is a protection very many times. And sometimes we have to stay in it until we're ready. And nobody can tell us when we're ready. You can go to 90 sessions of therapy. They're not going to tell you anything until you're ready. Because nobody deals with things until they're ready. And that's why that second stage of anger is so important. Because sooner or later, you've got to get in touch with your feelings and feel your feelings. But because many of us came out of some strong backgrounds where we were taught this stuff, we always thought that anger was something negative. But anger is a healthy emotion if it's used properly and processed properly. That's why in order to really do grieving, we can't do it alone. We need support. We need help. People around us to help us through it. It's a process we're going through. And so very many times, we're going to go through these stages of anger, these stages of frustration. Addicts know what I'm talking about. When you're in an active addiction, that's a normal. When you get into recovery and start the process of recovery, you, it's very scary. It's almost like starting your life all over again. And very many times what I want to do is go back to the old. Why? Because I'm used to it. And so there's that bargaining thing that goes on back and forth. I'm angry because I don't want to be here. And yet I want to be here. It's very really confusing. And it makes you a little crazy on the inside. That's why a lot of addicts relapse because they can't handle the change. They can't handle what they're feeling. They can't handle the stuff going on inside of them. So as a result, 
they have a tendency to very many times go back. And sometimes we got to do that. We got to go back, then come back, then go back, then come back. It's that bargaining stage. We get stuck in it so many times and so many people in the grieving process get trapped in that stage. I'll get deeper into that when I get into the session on that, but it's, it's a very powerful process that we go through in life when we're going through grieving. That's why there's no formula at the grieving. There's, just, there's stages, but those stages can be mixed. They can go back and forth. I can go into bargaining, back into denial, back into anger. I can jump around like crazy as I go through it. But this goes to many other areas of life. For example, relationships. If a relationship comes to an end, you have to say goodbye to it. You might even say intellectually, God, I'm glad to get out of that relationship. Thank God. But yet, think about it for a minute. You're angry. You invested years in that relationship, and it didn't work. You're angry that it didn't work. It's normal. A big part of it is trying to rationalize the whole thing. See, our intellect is always fighting with our emotions and our feelings. There's this war going on inside of us. And our intellect is always saying, well, let's just work it out, figure it out up here. Your, your feelings are saying, no, I got, I got to feel, I got to be in touch with this stuff. I got to hurt, I got to go through changes. And by the way, all this stuff is good, but it all takes time. It all happens in God's time, not in our time. It's a process we go through. And that goes for any major change in life. We experienced this very many times with a lot of uh, business people that were forced into retirement in their middle 50s, you know, in that area, and it sounded very nice. But once they got into retirement, they noticed good, they were going through depression and anxiety and going through a grieving process because they were so used to getting up, going to work, functioning. And now all of a sudden, this major change is taking place and it's scary. And as a result, what I want, I want to go back, but I can't go back. It's a scary process. Whenever we experience any kind of change in life, we go through this grieving process. We go through denial. We go through anger. We go through bargaining. We have to come to that point of sadness eventually. we we'll actually begin to experience the ending of something and moving forward. I call it the death process. See, I believe that we die a little bit every day in many different areas of our life. And death is being able to let go of a piece of your life that had come to an end to a new piece to be born. I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine who comes to the lectures all the time, a long time ago, I think 53 years ago, I was very young. I really was at one time. Believe me, Lana, I was. But back when I was a young priest, I was 20, like 27 years old, I performed this wedding. He sent me some photographs. And it was amazing when I looked at those photographs and look what I looked like back when I was 27 years old. I looked pretty damn good. I even had hair. It was unbelievable. And yet I look there and I look now and I say, what happened? But the bottom line is, I'm not 27 anymore. Those days are gone. I have to be able to come into the reality of today. And it's hard sometimes to say goodbye to things you used to be able to do, and now you can't do them anymore. To be able to make changes in your life, to begin to experience this process of aging, this process of growing, it's a grieving process. Why do you think people go through a midlife crisis? They go through traumatic issues in their life where they try to go back and be young again. You know, how many times you see 45-year-olds driving around in a convertible with their shirts open, their hair hanging out, their hair is kind of white, but that's no problem. And as a result, then they think that they're all this all over again. They're, they're, they're just playing that bargaining game. They're, they're going through grieving. They, they can't let go. They can't move on. And being trapped is a scary place to be, and yet we got to be there sometimes until we get tired of being there, until we're ready to move on. It's all part of grieving. It's all part of growing. It's all part of aging. It's all part of the process. You know, in my Indian meditation book, they always talk about the circle of life. You come in as a child, you go through the circle, you leave as a child. The bottom line is really interesting in the process. Child to, to young man, young adult, to move on, you know, to eventually come to the elder and become an elder and a teacher. 
and then be able to go back into maybe that infantile stage again and be able to say goodbye. It's a process we go through. A friend of mine put it very nicely. You come into the world in diapers and you go out in diapers. It's totally amazing. You come right down to it. Only the diapers are a little bigger at the end. But the bottom line is, it's a process we go through in life. And yet, I look at my life today, I guess I'm an elder. It's totally amazing. It's scary. You actually have to say that. But in reality, it's, it's beautiful too. See, I'm learning that concept, something can be beautiful and scary at the same time. Change can be beautiful, yet scary. Look at the pandemic we've gone through. You know, we, we experienced a lot of changes, a lot of new things in our life, a lot of new directions in our life. And so many people want to go back the way it was before. It's called bargaining. We're grieving the old because we're not going to go back. I'm sorry. We're going to have to move forward to a new normal, a new direction. We don't know where it's going to go. Nobody does. But the bottom line is we have to kind of go with it. And it's hard sometimes to say goodbye to the old. You know, I live in a 55 and older community, and I hear that every morning at the gym, about how if only things were the way they were back in the 40s and the 50s and back then and all that kind of stuff. And, I, and they're, still, they're still grieving. They're still grieving the loss of those days of their life. And they keep wanting to go back there and they can't. See, moving forward is always tough. It's not easy. Have to face things we don't want to face to move forward with it. You know, one of the things you experience all the time when it comes to death, you'll notice in hospitals, if somebody dies, they ask the family to come and see the body. There's a purpose behind that before they take the body away. Because that it's the way they activate the grieving process. You actually begin to see this person. And as a result, then it becomes real. Unfortunately, very many times people that die in airplane accidents or they disappear in a, a, a boat sinking or something of that effect, and the body is never found. And you never know for real whether it's real or not real. And there's always that wonderment that maybe there's some place they're going to come back, this to that effect. And all these things we go through inside of ourselves because in that bargaining stage, we're always bargaining with God, bargaining with all kinds of things, trying to figure it out. This is especially true in people that have lost children dramatically, especially through drug and alcohol overdose. People that have lost people suddenly. And they go through this because deep down inside, they keep wondering, if only I had saw this, if only I had saw that, if only I was able to do this, if only I should have did that, maybe if I did this, this wouldn't happen, maybe, 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 maybe. And that's all normal to feel that. And even to get angry at God and go through changes and why did this happen? You know, all these things are real normal and real powerful. And that's why it's so important that we have people to process this stuff with. If you don't process it, It'll stay stuck and buried inside of you, and you'll be able to let it go. That's why we need grief support groups. We need to be around people we can share things with, people we can talk about this stuff with. It's really important. You know, Thomas Merton said it beautifully, no one's an island. We can never stand alone. We have a connection. We need to have a need for one another. And that's where we learn over and over again and all of our support groups, our 12-step support systems and all that. It's a support that helps us to be able to listen, to process. I can hear your story and my story. We can work through stuff. By being able to share it and talk about it, it cleans out. It, gets, it begins to happen and moves forward. And yet sometimes in life, it takes time. You know, one of the things about grieving, people always ask me this question. How long does it take to go through a grieving process? I says, well, there is a theory that says normally 18 months to about three years. But I got to be honest with you, it doesn't work. You know, everybody has a different way in which they go through it. We're all human beings. We have our own feelings, what's going on inside of us. And if we isolate all the time, it's even harder. And that's why everything takes this time, this way in which we go through things. It's a process we have to go through. We have to be open to the process and let it happen. So I'm going to tell you something. The grieving process will take place in all of us 
whether we want it to or not. We might get stuck in a certain part of it, but it will take place. What happened in my case, I can tell you this right off the bat when I was in the priesthood, I knew intellectually, here's that intellect again versus your gut and your feelings. I knew intellectually I wanted to leave. I knew intellectually I didn't want to be there. And yet I still performed externally. But in my gut, I don't want to deal with it. So what did I do? I played the game many of us play. I got angry at everybody else. I blamed the church. I blamed my parents. I blamed the family. I blamed this. I blamed that. The blame game, as I call it. It was just me avoiding having to feel my feelings, get in touch with my feelings. And I thank God I had people, people who had the guts to keep saying to me over and over again, it's your issue, not theirs. It's your issue, not theirs. I don't want to hear that because I wasn't ready. But see, it's almost like you've got to go through the pain, the struggle of grieving until you're ready. And the hardest part is coming to the sadness, to have to look at the past and feel the sadness of it and begin the process of saying goodbye. I call this, once again, I said it before, the death process. And I'll talk a lot about that in future lectures to come. Well, it's really important for us to do closure, to say goodbye, to bring things to a conclusion so we can move on. See, acceptance is something that's very difficult to explain. We only come to acceptance when we are ready. This goes for addiction, it goes for everything else because just putting down drugs and alcohol, just putting down your eating disorder, whatever the physical part of it, the recovery has gotta be physical, it's gotta be emotional, it's gotta be spiritual, it's gotta be social, it's gotta be all the pieces of life gotta come together. It's a big part of it because we do grieving in that process too. Emotionally, our emotions are constantly changing. You have to learn to be in touch with them and be able to realize the fact we're allowed to have them. Spiritually, our life changes too. Our belief systems change over the course of years. Things begin to happen in different directions. It's okay. You know, the God of my understanding when I was a child is not my God of understanding today. And that's okay too. I look at my life and my connection with my higher power of God in a totally different way than I did when I was a kid. It's a process, even socially. My social aspects change. People in my life that I was close to for a long period of time, I may not be close to anymore. I have new people in my life today. And yet, I love the old, I love people that were there before, but they were another part of my journey. And that's why we're constantly in this process of changing, of moving in new ways and going in new directions. And so many of us don't want to do that, so what do we do? We try to maintain and stay in one little cocoon all the time. I feel safe in this cocoon. I don't want to get out of it. I'm afraid to move on. And yet, you got to be honest. We have to kind of melt ourselves to begin to get in touch with things inside of us. I mean, one of the examples I, I, I have to give it. My dad died when I was 26 years old. I was just ordained maybe four months when he died. And typical of the intellect, I went into my freeze mode. I actually helped the undertaker dress my father. I performed his funeral. I preached at his funeral. I did everything. Took care of all the arrangements, everything, the whole works. And my intellectual philosophy was, I can do this for everybody else, why can't I do it for him? I did the exact same thing for my mother when she died years later. And the bottom line was simply this. I never grieved my parents' death until the middle 80s. When I got into my eating disorder recovery finally. I had to deal with my feelings and get in touch with my feelings. And I realize this over and over again today. You know, it's sad I had to wait so long to be able to do closure and say goodbye to my parents and begin to work with it. Because I was even able to do things. I didn't know how I did them, but I did them. I mean, for example, my mother died in 1982. The doctor called me and said, you know, your mom just doesn't want to let go. She's pretty sick, Vince. She, I was a priest at the time. She says, you got to come up here and talk to her. 
because her biggest fear was if she died, who would take care of me? That's all my mother cared about, taking care of me. I went up and visited her in the hospital and spent some time with her. And I said, mom, look, I'm a big boy now. I can take care of myself. You don't have to worry anymore. So I want you to do something tonight. Her two favorite saints were St. Anthony and the Blessed Mother. I said, I want you to talk to the Blessed Mother and talk to St. Anthony. Tell them it's okay for you to go and spend some time with them. I left the hospital and got a phone call at six o'clock in the morning, she passed away. It's like I had to give her permission to move on. And this is so typical. And today I still don't know how I did it. Something inside of me got me to do it. But the bottom line is I realized over and over again that sometimes we have to, people have to help us with the grieving process. My mother was still grieving the fact that I was no longer a little boy and she could dote over and take care of and all this kind of stuff and everything else. She was stuck in that grieving process right up to her deathbed. And it's sad because in her mind, I was still two years old, three years old, four years old, whatever. You know, I even smile sometimes as to go home to visit her. The first thing she said to me, was your elbows are dirty, come upstairs, I'll scrub them. And I was in my 30s by that time. So, you know, what are you gonna do? You know, those old Italian moms, that's all part of it. But the bottom line was, it's amazing how long she stayed that way. And that's what I'm trying to say. Some people never come out of the bargaining stage. They stay stuck in it. It becomes a survival tool for them. It takes a long, long time hopefully they come out of that stage. And they're only gonna come out when they begin to talk and share and get things out of them and work through it because the hardest part of the grieving process is the sadness. It's the closure. It's the saying goodbye. It's being able to come to that point where I can watch a part of me come to an end and a new part of me has allowed them to be born. That's why I tell people, how can you when, will you, when will you know you're at the stage of acceptance? You'll know it in here, not in here. Try to remember, the grieving process cannot take place up here. It's got to take place inside. That's for the aging process. That's for everything we go through in life. You have to realize that. You know, I'm not going to be 26 again. I'm not going to have hair again. My life is always going to be what it is. I have to come to the acceptance that I can do what I can do today and that's all I can do. And only I can come to that. Nobody else can. And I have to realize the fact that everything around me changes too. If you're a grandparent, you know what I'm talking about because those grandkids have this, this crazy thing they do is they don't stay little anymore. They grow up. You know, they actually get married. Wow. How are they supposed to do that stuff? You know, I remember when I said, take you by your hand and take you down the street and all of a sudden now you're married. There's a sadness to that. Because yes, I do miss it. I miss taking them places, going to Chuck E. Cheese and places with them and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Thomas the Tank Engine, all, all that kind of crazy. I, I miss it all. And yet, I realize the fact that was a part of my life I gotta say goodbye to, be open to a new part. But there's still a part of me that goes back to see Thomas anyway myself. But the bottom line is, it's nostalgia then too. You know, and sometimes we have things that help connect us to this too, which is really important. I know in my case, I love going to Stroudsburg to these steam trains, mainly because when I'm around those trains, I get tears in my eyes. Memories of my father come back to me and the trips we took on those steam trains years ago. And these things are important. It's a part of me being connected to him and being able to continue the grieving process of saying goodbye to him. So now instead of goodbye, he's part of me now. And yet it took me so long to get there. You might think when I was in the priesthood, I'd be able to do this grieving process. No. It was only later in my life I was finally able to deal with it. 
And that's something that's really important because we need the memories. We need things to be connected to. I had a wonderful experience of writing my, the book, My Spiritual Journey, kind of the story of my life. I enjoyed writing it because I still can't believe some of the things I did as I went through that book and looked at it. And yet I realized over and over again, that was part of the journey. And yet I can't go back and do that stuff today. I mean, I was a prison chaplain for a long time. But to be honest with you, I don't have the energy to be a prison chaplain now. I can have nostalgia about starting point back when we were a soup kitchen in a halfway house. I don't have that kind of energy anymore. I can't do it. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it. So it's a big point of it. There's an acceptance involved in that. You come to the point where I can only do what I can do and stay where I can stay and then move forward from there and then see what develops from the process of that. You know, I don't, you know, it's amazing, like driving at night in the dark. I, I, my, my vision is not as good as it used to be. Well, those glaring lights and everything to that effect. Things change, you change. Your physical body changes. You have ailments, they last longer. You go through more changes in your life. Keep that in mind, Ben. But the bottom line is these are things that happen as you go through it. He's a young guy. That's beautiful. But it's a process we go through in life. And, you know, so a whole big thing we have to realize, and that's the important part of it. So what I really want to share with you tonight is kind of an overview of the grieving process, how the grieving process works. And realize the fact that this is a process that is part of life's journey. Patrick Karn says something very beautiful. He said the 12 step philosophy, the 12 step program is one of the greatest, greatest processes for grieving there is alive. He praises it up and down. And he says that because he says it's a formula to help you go through the change, the grieving process, to be able to let go of the old, to move into the new. And I really believe it's very deep, deeply because I don't think the founders knew what they were doing when they did this, that it was going to become what it is today. Because they were dealing with one specific thing way back then. And yet life goes on, it changes, moves in new directions. Got to be open to that, open to new areas and new life. I can learn from the elders, which I did, thank God for that. But I have to realize, you know, they're not here anymore. I can carry their wisdom and pass it on. Because sooner or later, I look at that lecture hall memorial and my name will be up there someday. I don't know when. But, you know, I told the writer to save a place for me. Beautiful part of it. Because we don't, no one knows. I mean, that's the beautiful part about life. And I love life for that purpose. We don't know. All we know about is today. We have to look back on yesterday and the memories of yesterday and realize they're memories. We can't go back. I'm sorry. I can go to that memorial wall and I can look at names on that wall and memories and all kinds of things will come up for me. I can look back on people from 1977, 1978, people that were in my houses, people I was connected with back then. I can have memories of it. But they're only memories. I can't go back. I can't go back to the past. I have to be able to face it, deal with it, process it, and work through it, and work into the present. And even with the future, the unknown, I have to not, not live in fear of the unknown, to be open to the unknown. And so it really takes a lot of work inside of yourself to be able to do this process, to open this process up, and to realize how important and how special it is. And so to me, the grieving process is a process we all go through every day of our life. Even in relationships, guess what? They don't stay the same. Even as you grow in a relationship, your connection to the person you're with hopefully grows. If it stays static, it's not going to go anywhere. So it's changed. I look at Ray and Mary up there, you know, you're not the same place you were when you first got married, are you? I don't think so. So it changes. It's all part of it. It's wonderful. That's what it's supposed to be about. And yes, we got to say goodbye. I know we say goodbye to a very special person. 
Walter, you know what I'm talking about. Walter just lost his wife, a very special part of starting point for a long period of time, you know, and we have to say goodbye. But now she's part of our history and connected to us. She's a beautiful lady. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful for the life she had, you know, and as really, she gave so much of herself. And yet at the same time, she was able to do closure. And, and, and the big point I want to bring out is sometimes you care somebody when they're on their deathbed for a period of time, you've already started the grieving process because you're already starting to feel the grieving taking place deep down inside as you're going through it with them. It's a powerful process and yet it's so beautiful at the same time. And so I hope this helps you just to understand just a little bit better what the grieving process is. Next week, I wanna really concentrate in a lot more depth on the denial, anger, bargaining stages and go through them and give you examples and stuff to connect with to realize the fact how important those stages are and part of our process. But the important thing is we can't stay there. And too many people stay angry for the rest of their life. They stay stuck for the rest of their life. Don't do that. We gotta be able to say goodbye and be able to move on. And so my prayer tonight, I wanna pray that we have the strength and the courage in each of our lives to be open to this process and to allow this process to help us to move forward as beautiful human beings on the journey of life. Let us pray. God, we come before you tonight in prayer. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your direction. We ask you to help us as we navigate the process of life. Help us to be able to let go of the old, be open to the new, to live in the present. Teach us to ask for your help and your guidance every day. Teach us to be able to seek both your help and the help of others as we walk the journey of this earth. Please, God, help us not to walk alone, to realize how much we need to say those magical words of help, guidance, ask for direction, and be able to work through the things inside of us to move forward and move forward in a positive and beautiful way. And so with gratitude and with love, we come to you and we say thank you. Thank you for this process. Thank you for the process of life. Help us to live it to the fullest. We ask and we ask this and that you bless us and guide us as we go on this journey. And we ask this in your name. Amen. And now I'm going to ask if you want to unmute yourself and our Maestro Pat will try to lead us to the we version of the serenity prayer. It's all yours, Pat. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God's will, not mine, be done. <laughs>